Give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his loyal love endures. One of the great joys of reading Psalms is to see how they're fulfilled in Jesus. And that's no less true of Psalm 118 that we used a few moments ago. Over and over, the Psalm points us to the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified, risen, ascended and returning. And it's the return of Jesus that's the focus of our service today. As we continue to work our way through Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul here encourages us with these words. We believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. In other words, there's a direct parallel between Jesus and us. Jesus died, we will die. Jesus rose from the dead, we will be raised from the dead. And for believers, we will be with him forever. We'll look at that passage a bit more fully later in the service. But as we begin today, we're reminded that the Lord is good and his loyal love endures. What was true for the Christians in Thessalonica is still true for us today because God's loyal love endures. He keeps his promises. Welcome to our service today. We're delighted that you're able to join us wherever you are in the world. It is such an amazing privilege to join with Christians around the world to worship together. But it will be an even greater privilege to worship together around the throne of God in eternity. Everything we do now prepares us for that wonderful day. Everything we do now points us towards that glorious day. So as we begin our time together today, let's greet one another with words that remind us who we are. Do join with me in the response to each statement, and that'll appear in bold print on the screen. We are God's church. We come together to worship. He has given us his word. We come together to learn from him. He has filled us with his power. We go out to bring others to him. He has called us into his family. We come together to share our lives. He has put his words on our lips. We go out to tell the world about him. He has given us his spirit. We come together to celebrate. He has showered us with his riches. We go out to share his goodness with others. He has freed us from our past. We come together to move forwards. He has planned for us a glorious future. We go out to live our lives to please him. We are God's church. We come together to worship. Let's begin by singing about Jesus together. Jesus, the name high over all, in hell or earth or sky, angels and men before it fall, and devils fear and fly.
Jesus, the name to sinners dear, the name to sinners given. It scatters all their guilty fear and turns their hell to heaven. What an amazing truth that's expressed in those words. We have some wonderful new songs and we're singing a great new song later in our service. Some of the old hymns resonate so deeply with our spiritual experience. Jesus, the name to sinners dear. His name is dear to us because of all that he has done for us through his death on the cross. Because he died for us, he scatters all our guilty fear and turns our hell. But no matter how real that is in our lives, we still live as if it were not true. And so we need to come back to Jesus constantly, renewing our relationship with him, asking afresh his forgiveness. And so we're going to be quiet for a moment, thinking back over the past few days at the ways in which we have lived for ourselves rather than for God. And then we'll pray together. Let's be quiet just for a moment. So let's pray together. Lord God, have mercy on us. According to your steadfast love and in your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions, cleanse us from our sin, create in us a clean heart and life, and continually renew a right spirit within us. Amen. These words based on Psalm 51. The Lord your God loves you and has mercy on you. He forgives your waywardness and your sin. He cleanses your heart and your life and will renew a right spirit within you. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, Bev is having a few days off, so we're delighted that Tabby is with us today. So let's go and join Tabby. Well, 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 hello there, everybody. How are we all today? What are you doing on this fine Sunday? So it's actually Tuesday for me, and I am currently packing. Um, as you can see, I'm not doing a particularly good or neat job of it. Um, so I might have to redo some of it. Um, but packing, packing's a funny thing, isn't it? Um, everybody does it differently. Have you ever been somewhere that you need to pack for? Um, why don't you tell me, shout it out. Have you been on holiday or to a sleepover, to visit family or maybe even to move house? Well, the last reason, moving house, that's why I'm packing. Um, and I'm not just moving house, I'm, I'm actually moving cities. Um, I'm moving all the way across England. Um, and that, that sounds pretty big when you think about it, doesn't it? Um, to be honest, I've been having a lot of mixed feelings about it. Um, I've been a bit worried and, and to be honest as well, sometimes feeling a bit scared about a lot of it. Um, you know, I'm sad to leave you guys, my church family, and, and leaving Bath and, and finding somewhere to live in time to move. Um, do you ever feel like that about something? Um, it might be moving house, or starting a new school, or even when you think you've got something a bit wrong, we can feel quite worried about that, can't we? Um, and when we're worried about things, it, it can feel really scary sometimes, can't it? Um, like we don't know what to do with all of our emotions. But the good news is that the Bible has some really helpful things to say about where, or rather, who we can go to when we feel like that. One verse I find really helpful in this time is this one. Cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. So cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So 
Where does this verse tell us that we can go when we feel like that? Well, it tells us that we can cast all, not just some, but all our anxiety on him. And who does it mean by him? Well, it means God. So we can take all these worries and fears and cast them on God. We can tell him about them. And most importantly, we can trust him with them. Because the second amazing part of this verse reminds us really importantly that we can do all of this because God cares for us. He wants us to come to him when we feel these things, to look to him for guidance, and most importantly, to trust his plan his plan for us through these things, which seem scary to us, but ultimately are all part of his plan. So next time you feel a bit scared or worried, whether it's about packing or about something completely different, remember you can talk to God about all those feelings. You can cast them on him and trust that he will care for you through it all. So finally, Let's remind ourselves where we can go by saying the verse together. Are we ready? So God's word says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5 verse 7. Thanks for saying it with me, guys, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a great day. Bye. Like an earthworm trying to do press ups, like a potato trying to swim, like a mountain trying to brush its teeth when we don't rely on him. When we pray, we trust our Father, that's what Jesus said. So I'll stop trusting in myself and pray to God instead. Lizzie Poole and I work with Wycliffe Bible Translators. I'm currently in Tanzania, but by the time you're watching this, my per work permit will have expired and I will be preparing to return to the UK. Please pray for me as I prepare to return. There is a lot to sort out in terms of sorting and packing and the COVID testing process is not straightforward. Please pray particularly that when I get tested, the result would come through in time and that it would be negative. Although I'm leaving Tanzania, this is not the end of my time working with Bible translation here as I will continue to work alongside my Tanzanian colleagues remotely from the UK. And once travel is simpler, I should be able to visit on business visas. I'm working on language analysis and developing writing systems for two languages, Bugwe and Rangi, 
and both of these projects will continue to need linguistic input. The Ranky New Testament will hopefully soon be completed. All of the books have been checked by a translation consultant. The next step is for the whole text to be read aloud with a group of Rangi people to check that the language is natural and understandable. Most of the books have been through this process, but there are a few remaining, and before they can be finished, we need to implement some spelling changes so that what the community see during their check is what will actually be printed. Please pray for me and the translator, Kiju, as we read through the remaining books to find where these changes need to be made. In the last video I sent, I asked you to pray for the Invoke by Jesus film. Praise God that the recording was completed at the beginning of July and the plans are underway for a launch event in September. Here is a short video of some of the celebrations at the end of the Jesus film recording. translators are reviewing the draft of Acts of the community. Praise God that they completed the consultant check successfully and pray as they discuss together how to translate certain important words such as believer. When the community has approved the translation, the team are planning to publish an audio version in order to make it available as quickly as possible and once that is completed we will work on finalising the text for a print version as well. Thank you all for your continued prayers for the work of sharing God's word in Tanzania in the languages the people of Tanzania can truly understand. Some words from Psalm 143 as we begin. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Show me the way I should go, for to you I lift up my soul. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this morning, we pray that we would be refreshed and strengthened by your unfailing love as we put our trust in you. As we lift up our souls to you, guide us to live for your praise and glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you very much for the work of Lizzie Poole in Tanzania. Thank you for all the work done in the Rangi speaking area and for agreement over particular writing issues. And we pray that as the changes to the translation text are implemented, they would allow Rangi speakers to understand the truth of your word and take it into their hearts. We also praise you for the completed Jesus film that will soon be available for people to download onto smartphones. And we pray also that the distribution of the film in other formats would run smoothly, enabling as many Mbugwe people as possible to watch the film. And in light of the news that Lizzie's work permit appeal has been rejected, we pray for real wisdom, clarity and peace as she and the Wycliffe Bible Translation team decide where she needs to move in order to continue her linguistics work. Would they follow the words of Psalm 143? Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. And we pray now for our world. Heavenly Father, we lift the world to you as we see the devastating effects of our changing climate. Wildfires raging, floods, extreme temperatures, drought, famine. We recognise that human greed, corruption and selfishness are having an effect, where those who are most vulnerable suffer the consequences most. We cry to you for forgiveness and pray that you would mercifully spare people from the consequences of human sin. We pray over the work of those battling to bring wildfires under control and to bring relief to those devastated by flooding. 
We pray that you would empower their efforts to help those in need and extend your protection over them. We pray that governments would make wise decisions that steward this planet's resources carefully and that we would all act as responsible stewards of your creation, mindful of our impact on the planet. And we pray for ourselves as a church family. Finally, Heavenly Father, we pray that we would be growing more and more into the mature body of Christ in each area of our lives, that we would be steadfast in our love for you, not tossed back and forth by the waves, but grounded and confident in the truths of your word. Give us opportunities to build one another up this week, speaking the truth to one another in love, so that we would all be equipped for works of service. And we pray all of these things in the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And we bring our prayers together in the word of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen.
Our reading is Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind, who have no hope. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Those very powerful and well-known words at the opening of Dylan Thomas's poem, Do Not Go Gentle Into That Good Night. The poem reminds us that one of the most painful experiences that we go through as human beings is the experience of loss and bereavement. The loss and bereavement when someone close to us, a friend, a relative, perhaps a spouse or even a child, dies. It is a painful experience for all people, as Dylan Thomas expresses. But it's no less painful for us as Christians. And for all of us, it reminds us of our own mortality. It reminds us that we too will ultimately face death. But how should we as Christians face death? How should we face the death of a loved one or even face our own death? Should we, as Dylan Thomas suggests, rage? Rage against the dying of the light? It's a question that lies behind the next few verses of Paul's letter to the Thessalonian church. Paul's letter responds to a very specific issue in the church there. There seems to have been an expectation that Jesus would return very, very soon. They knew of Jesus' birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, and their expectation would that be that his return would happen very quickly. And that meant that the Thessalonians hadn't expected people to die before the return of Jesus. But now people were dying. What would happen to them? Would they somehow be disadvantaged when Jesus returned? Would they lose out on eternal life because they were no longer alive when Jesus appeared? Well, I guess it's a problem that's very specific to the early church in that particular form. And yet, underneath it is the constant issue for Christians in the face of death. How should we respond when faced with the death of our friends who are believers? How should we react when we face our own death as a believer? And Paul wants the Thessalonians and wants us to be very clear about this. You see, if you're not clear, then every death of a Christian that we face will be debilitating and damaging to our faith. And more than that, we won't know how to live in the expectation and certainty of our own death. So, says Jesus here in verse 13, brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death. But he goes on and gives us the reason. 
He says, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Just as we've seen previously, again, we have here a clash of cultures between the Christians and others. We recognise that grief is part of our natural and right human response to loss. Jesus wept at Lazarus's tomb. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Paul wants us to see that we are not like other people. And our grief should be transformed by hope. How do you respond to death in that kind of way? How do you have that kind of hope in the face of death? Well, Paul suggests four things for us to take hold of from this passage. First of all, our assurance is in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Now, why do we imagine that we can have any hope at all in the face of the ultimate enemy Death itself. Well, it's very simple, says Paul. And it has nothing to do with us. Nothing to do with you, nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with Jesus. It is the death and the resurrection of Jesus. Look at verse 14. For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him in him. That is the great assurance that we have. Our knowledge of Jesus' death and his resurrection is the assurance that believers themselves will be raised to new life. But that assurance is not based on anything about me or anything about you. It's based on what we believe about Jesus. And we believe, we know that God raised him from the dead. And so it is through him, by being in him, in Christ, that our resurrection is possible and is guaranteed. There is a very simple parallel because we are in Christ, we are in Jesus. One thing is dependent upon the other because Jesus died and was raised to life. When we also die, because we are in Christ, we also will be raised from the dead in Christ. And that's why the bodily resurrection of Jesus is so fundamental to our faith. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 17 onwards, he says, if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope only for this life, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, says Paul, in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Jesus first and then us following. And we will receive resurrection bodies in which there is no arthritis, no dementia, no cancer, no physical or mental frailty, and no sin. But do you see how our resurrection not only follows on and is dependent upon the resurrection of Jesus, but is effectively guaranteed by the resurrection of Jesus? If you believe in him, and implied is that, in that is the essence of the gospel, that Jesus died for our sins and was raised for our justification. If you believe he died and rose again, then God will bring you with him. And that is the hope that we have. It's not a wishful thinking hope, the <laughs> hope that it might be sunny tomorrow, but a certain hope, a certain hope founded on the action of God in history, in the person of his son, Jesus, who is the guarantee of our resurrection.
And so our assurance is in the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But then secondly, our anticipation is in the return of Jesus. Do you see how this whole passage focuses on that great and glorious day? That day in the future when Jesus will return. Do you see the glorious description of that day here? Glorious and yet tantalising because it still leaves so many questions unanswered. The first thing we see here is the constant use of the word asleep and sleep. And the phrase asleep has so often been used in scripture, but also by Christians to describe God's people in death. In fact, the word cemetery comes from the word to sleep, a place of sleeping. And it gives us a sense of expectation that we will be woken up to new life. Just look at uh, verse 16 here. You see, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. I can tell you there are mornings when I could do with an alarm clock like that. At that glorious day, the dead in Christ will be awakened and they will rise first, says Paul. Far from missing out on the resurrection, they're the first ones there. They won't miss out. All those loved ones who've gone before us, they won't miss out in any way. They'll be ahead of us. And if you and I die before Jesus returns, we won't miss out either. D.L. Moody, the great evangelist, once said, if one day you read in the newspaper that D.L. Moody is dead, do not believe it. I shall be more alive on that day than ever before. You see, Moody was looking forward with assurance to the day when at the return of Jesus, he and all believers in Christ will be raised to life. And then after that, verse 17 says that those believers who are alive at the return of Jesus will be caught up in the clouds in the presence of God and meet the Lord Jesus. You know how there are some people who want all the details now. If you've invited them to go somewhere, then they want to know exactly where they go when they get out of the railway station. Do they turn left? Do they turn right? Do they go down this road? Do they turn down that road? What's the shop on the corner of the road called? What's the colour of the door on the house? They want all the detail. And some people are like that with the return of Jesus. But we're not given that here or anywhere else in the Bible. You see, we don't need to worry. We don't need to be anxious about the detail because God has all of that perfectly in hand. His focus is on the day of Christ. He's the only one who knows the date. He's the only one who knows when that will be. But it is the day when Jesus will return. And all believers, those living and those who have already died, will be raised. And so our anticipation is in the return of Jesus. But then thirdly, our confidence is in the power of Jesus. Now, look again at these descriptions here. Look again at verse 16. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet call of God. The Lord himself will come down. God, in the person of Jesus, will personally return. He doesn't just send a messenger. He doesn't send a team of angels. Jesus 
will return. Just as at that first coming, just as that first Christmas, it was God in the person of Jesus who came personally into our world. So when he returns, it is a personal return in the person of the Lord Jesus. And he'll come with a cry of command. The word for cry here has the force of urgency and authority. There'll be no uncertainty there. Jesus comes and the dead in Christ rise. And believers are caught up at his command to be with him. We don't have to do anything on that day. It won't be like the Titanic where you might have had to queue for a lifeboat as the world sink to, dis- to destruction and the queue gets longer and longer. It will be the most wonderful day when we see Jesus as he is, in all his majesty and in all his sovereign power. And he will simply take us to be with him. Suddenly, by the power of God himself, we will be caught up with Christ. You know, as we grow older, we often become more aware of our frailty and our weaknesses. But we don't need to worry. Our confidence is not in our own ability to raise ourselves. Our confidence is in the power of God to raise us. Our confidence is in the power of Jesus. But then fourthly, Our comfort is in the presence of Jesus. Now, the final picture here looks quite confusing to us. Uh, We're caught up in the clouds if we're still alive. We meet Jesus in the air. But the point of the description is not to give us specific detail, not to tell us about the geography of the second coming, as it were. The focus here is in a different direction. Look carefully at verse 17. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Here's the emphasis. We are caught up together with them. In other words, the believers who've gone before us will be there with us at the end. And we shall see them. Those dear friends, those dear believing friends and family who've gone before us will be there. And we shall be together with them at the end. And we shall be together, that great multitude that no one can number, finally standing and worshipping around the throne of heaven. If the greatest pain of death is the loss of relationships and friendships, Paul assures us that we shall be together again. Believers together is the comfort that we have for the future. But it's not just believers together. Look further on in verse 17. And so we will be with the Lord forever. We should be with the Lord forever. Always, forever, the whole of eternity, with the Lord, together with other believers, together with the Lord. And that is the comfort and the hope, the certainty that we have. This is not some lonely existence of our very of our minds in some kind of vacant place. Films often portray heaven as very white and very lonely. But it won't be. Loneliness will be banished for eternity because we will be together as believers and together with the Lord. Perhaps the most important command is in verse 18. 
Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Yes, we will be sad when loved ones die, but we are not to grieve in hopelessness because we are people of hope. And we are to encourage one another with these glorious truths that our assurance is in the death and the resurrection of Jesus, not in us, but in him. Their anticipation is in the return of Jesus, an absolute certainty at a point that God has decided. That our confidence is in the power of Jesus. We don't have to do anything. He will do it all. Our comfort is in the presence of Jesus, together as believers, together with the Lord, forever. Therefore, don't despair. In the face of death, the death of loved ones, the face in the face of our own death, don't despair, but comfort one another with these words. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we confess that all of us, in one way or another, fear death. It is that great unknown in so many ways. And our temptation is to, uh, re to resist, to, uh, uh, to be fearful. Father, as we listen to these encouraging words, these comforting words from Paul writing to the Thessalonians, help us to encourage one another with these words and to be encouraged ourselves that we might face death, the death of loved ones particularly, but also our own death. With grief, that natural human sadness, but also with certain hope that we will be together as believers, together with the Lord forever. Amen.
And so we will be with the Lord forever, says 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Words we just sung, unto the grave, what shall we sing? Christ, he lives, Christ, he lives. And what reward will heaven bring? Everlasting life with him. There we will rise to meet the Lord. Then sin and death will be destroyed and we will feast in endless joy when Christ is ours forevermore. Isn't it great to have that absolute certainty, that assurance from God's word? No matter what struggles we may be facing at the moment, one day we will be with Jesus and enjoying him forever. Well, we've come to the end of our service as a church. We're looking at the next stage of returning to some form of normality after the pandemic. And over the next couple of weeks, we'll be moving from a pre-recorded service at 10.30 to live streaming one of our in-person services. And that will still be available here on our YouTube channel from Sunday morning. So it will still be available for all of us but it will have a slightly different format. More about that in the next couple of weeks. We're just so grateful that you've joined with us today and we look forward to being with you again in this format next week. But let's pray as we close. May we be united in Christ. Enjoy the comfort of his love, the fellowship of his spirit, the tenderness and compassion of our God. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with us always. Amen.
Oh.